Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining um, today's Beginner's Guide to Retrofit. It is a Supply Chain Support Masterclass. My name is Alex Kramersmith, and I'm a Junior Sustainability Consultant at Turner and & Townsend. And we're joined today by Owen Daggett, a Principal Consultant also from Turner & Townsend. Just to inform you, this is a Retrofit Information Support and Expertise event, which is fully funded by the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero, delivered by ourselves, Turner & Townsend. We have been given the following information from the department. We're only able to comment or provide clarifications on the draft wave three guidance, which was published earlier in May at this time. We cannot comment on timings or next steps for SHDF wave three or any other government schemes. When we're able to do so, we will. Thank you everyone for joining and I'll now hand over to Owen to start the presentation. Thank you. Uh, great, thanks for Alex and good afternoon everybody. Hope everyone's doing well. As Alex said, today is something that we've put together as part of a, a complete beginner's guide to retrofit. And this is actually very much focused on our supply chain week. Through through the RISE service, we've introduced a new work stream, which is focusing on the supply chain. And we're doing that through two different routes, working directly with the supply chain to try and encourage and support more SMEs and more contractors to deliver high quality retrofit but it's also to support housing providers and housing organizations to work more effectively with their supply chain as well so that you know they're more informed and the two can work to stick together more productively to ultimately deliver better out outputs we've got a series of events running all week this week monday through friday and we've got a couple of wrap-up sessions next week as well so hopefully this is a good chance for those of you that haven't been involved in retrofit before or, or maybe dipped toe in the water to understand a bit more and if you follow you know, follow us through the next few days you'll hopefully get a good understanding of a range of things today though is very much taking things back to some of the key um, areas so we're gonna you know have a quick look at uh, what housing retrofit is some of the key terms in it what options you might consider with retrofit how we measure energy efficiency some of the roles and responsibilities if you're going to carry out retrofit and then we're just going to sort of bring all that together in, in the concept of a retrofit strategy please do drop any questions in the chat as we go and uh, we can take any verbal questions at the end as well we should have plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end so in terms of background then i guess you know the question is if we're talking about retrofit, that must mean we need to change something. So, you know, what's wrong with business as usual? Why do we need to retrofit our housing stock in the first place? Well, there's two main reasons. Fuel poverty, or to some extent now, just general poverty, and the climate crisis. And obviously what we can see here is a you know a range of headlines that have made the uh, the news quite recently around you know uh, food poverty charities uh, saying that energy bills hikes are a nightmare you know these are all things we've felt in our own homes as well a uh, number of households in england fuel poverty increasing by a hundred thousand challenge of decarbonizing homes and buildings to meet the climate crisis and so on there's lots of things at work here that were really hard to overcome you know we, we're trying to address poverty and address climate change so retrofitting homes it's quite a difficult approach but it's something that we must really try and embrace and take control of and you know there's other reasons we need to retrofit the homes as well the ideal solution would be to think well you know new homes are much more effective they're much more efficient so can't we just build new homes to replace the rest well obviously we've got to think about the embedded carbon impact of demolishing and rebuilding our existing stock, the fact that we've got people living in the homes and what, what we do with the people living in the homes. The key purpose for us now and the key aim for us uh, you know, across the UK is to address our old inefficient housing stock to make it fit for purpose for now and for the future. And when we look at, at some of the reasons for that, residential properties in the UK account for around about 23% of our carbon emissions and three quarters of these emissions come from domestic heating. Uh, obviously the majority of domestic heating at the moment is from gas, from gas boilers. We've also got amongst the, in the UK we've also got some of the oldest least efficient housing stock in Europe. So this graph on the right hand side is an indication of the home temperature loss after five hours of heating it up to temperature. So you can see the homes at green are the homes that keep the heat in better. So they're obviously better insulated. The homes in red and orange are those that lose heat quicker, red being the worst. And you can see there that the UK is, uh, you know, one of the where worst countries in Europe in terms of homes losing heat out of the building fabric over that five hour period. And these are all challenges that we're facing now in terms of heating our homes to make them comfortable 
in amongst that challenging energy bill scenario, which isn't going to massively change, you know, moving forward. Hopefully we've stopped seeing the massive increases that we all saw over the last 15 months, but they're not going to come down drastically. So the prices that we see now are those that we need to get used to. And, you know, the reason that we see those red colours in the UK is that many of our homes are inefficient. They've got poor or no insulation. They're quite drafty, uh, which allows hot air to leave faster uh, and cool air to enter in. And so that means, obviously, that occupants must heat their homes to off offset these losses. This obviously impacts on negatively on the environment and living standards. So a number of challenges that we need to work around. So the question is, well, how do we do that? Well, we've got a number of targets that, that we've set in the UK to try and drive housing performance to better standards. So we've got an EPC 2030 target in social housing. So EPC stands for Energy Performance Certificate. Uh, and this is a way that we measure the energy performance of housing stock. Uh, the aim here is to upgrade all UK social housing stock to a minimum of EPCC by 2030. Uh, and the idea is this is to try and do it through thermal efficiency and fabric first approaches. So that's using uh, you know insulation measures, quite simple measures that allow that home to get to a decent level. EPCC is good, you know, it's not the best, but it sort of sets a springboard in terms of where to go in the future. And that where to go in the future is what we see on the right hand side, uh, which is a net zero by 2050. So ultimately, we need to then accelerate from that 2030 target or, or from where we are now to decarbonize all sectors. So that, that's not just housing stock, it's all UK buildings, transport, etc. And we're going to do this by trying to bring clean electricity uh, into the grid from late 2035 and you know through the rest of that decade and we're also going to see a massive transition away from uh, gas heating through the use of electrification so obviously as a grid gets greener and it's more uh, climate advantage and advantageous to use electricity we'll start to use heat pumps more and more to heat our homes there's lots of challenges with this with, with this approach obviously we've got high costs carrying out these measures versus long-term savings. You know, the savings that we see on this aren't going to be overnight. Some of these savings are going to take years and years to recoup. We've got technical uh, and investment constraints as well. So, you know, heat pumps aren't a mass deployment technology yet. Lots of other measures aren't mass deployment measures yet as well. So we've got to try and overcome some of the technical barriers stopping that happening and some of the financial sort of in infrastructure approaches that allow it to to, to effectively take place as well. And ultimately, we need to make sure that we're trying to meet the needs of the end user, which is the resident and the community. We're talking about changing, you know, how estates, how uh, neighbourhoods look, how, and how they how they work. Really, we need to take different strateg strategic approaches to that. So we need to look at energy efficiency upgrades through insulation, through heating, through lighting, to get some of the more basic measures done. We then need to look at how we can bring renewable energy into the into the into the picture. Uh, we're going to talk around some of those technologies later, but obviously. Doing the, doing the measures alone isn't the solution. We need to engage the occupants of them as well. So we need resident engagement and community engagement as a key tool to, to unlock in the potential to meet EPCC and net zero by 2030. So what is housing retrofit? And it's often good to go back to the basics on this actually, because we all talk about retrofit or, or we may have heard about it. What is a retrofit? Well, retrofit is, defi is defined by Trustmark as a process of making changes to existing buildings to reduce energy consumption and associated emissions. So if we know that's the, the definition of retrofit, well, what's the purpose of it then? What's the point? Well, it's about trying to make bills more affordable trying to make homes more comfortable so you can have a, a more comfy thermal temperature in your home without the expense of having to heat it to high temperatures. It's about meeting regulatory compliance. So those two targets that I just talked about, are, are, you know, regulatory compliance uh, mechanisms that we need to meet. So it's about making sure we hit those targets. But it's also about future proofing our homes as well. You know, we mentioned at the start of the presentation, existing homes are here to stay. We can't replace them with new homes. So we need to make sure the current building stock is upgraded and made effective and efficient for future generations. And that's not just protecting it against, you know, fuel bills and uh, reducing carbon emissions. It's also thinking about a changing climate externally and protecting the homes from overheating, from flood risk and so on as well. And all of this brings added benefits to 
to the, to the resident. We talked about affordable bills, but it also res results in a healthier, warmer home, which reduces health risks. There's a lot of research out there on the on the benefits of uh, energy efficiency and uh, respiratory disease. Uh, so, you know, obviously, if we can try and improve housing stock, we'll reduce our health risk and hopefully uh, benefit the residents of the homes and ultimately drive lower emissions from the housing stock. And what we're trying to do there is, you know, remove the challenges of fuel poverty, cold and damp and mould, some of the things we hear about more and more in the news these days of non-compliance and unsafe homes. Again, something that we're trying to, we're starting to hear more about in, in the media as well health risks and wasted energy you know that that's ultimately what we're trying to address through retrofit so when we talk about retrofit there's a number of key terms that are, are worth just picking up at the start so i may have mentioned it already uh, but fabric first is a, a, a sort of term that's quite pertinent at the moment fabric first is really about trying to produce heat demand first by making sure that the fabric or the building envelope so that's basically you know the walls the roof the floor and the windows and the doors to make sure they're all optimized for thermal efficiency so that's trying to make them as well insulated and as uh, free of drafts as possible as well and then the idea of fabric first is that once you've got that right that's when you can start to then look at upgrading heating systems and looking at alternative renewable energy technologies as well but it's very much about doing things in those sequential steps to try and drive down that heat demand as much as possible first before you then start thinking about changing measures in terms of heating heating technologies and adding energy generating technologies to the property and the other approach kind of tying in with Fabric First is a whole house plan. So a whole house plan is where there's a comprehensive plan for home improvements, but whole house plans are quite restrictive because they often need a lot of time and a lot of money. So the idea of a whole house plan is that interventions are planned and sequenced in an appropriate manner to avoid unintended consequences. So for example, if you were going to replace the boiler and insulate the home, you'd insulate the home first to reduce the heat demand of the property, which means that you could actually then get a smaller boiler to heat the same size space, rather than if you replace the boiler first and didn't insulate the property, you'd end up with a much bigger heat demand and you'd end up with a big boiler that was probably oversized when it came to insulating the property later on. So it's really important in that whole house approach to consider the building or the home uh, as an integrated system rather than individual elements. And, and this is something that's going to be really key on that journey to 2050 is recognising the fact that there's going to be times when measures will be carried out and times when measures need to be planned in, you know, for the next 5, 10, 15 years. So having that whole house plan approach is really critical to, to successful retrofit. And some of the other terms that we, we talk about then, the things uh, associated with that fabric first approach. So air infiltration. So We've got a thermal image shot here. Hopefully you might have seen thermal images before, but we've got a scale of colours from yellow and green to, to red and blues. And the idea here is that where we've got the reds, we can see there's lots of heat loss from the property. And where it's green and yellow, it means that there's good levels of insulation. So a simple example of air infiltration is where air flows through gaps in the building fabric. So for example, the cracks of a window surrounds, or maybe around the walls, sorry, around the door, around the door junction. So you can see here on this image of the house, we've got a door on the right hand side in what looks like a porch. And we can see that there's a, a almost a red frame that surrounds it. Uh, and, and that's where the air is you know, passing through the gaps and cracks and that heat's getting out of the property. So this is air infiltration in terms of how that operates in a property. Thermal bypass re refers to air movement through or around insulation. So it effectively bypasses its, proper, its purposes and reduces its thermal performance. So again here, we've got an example of a, a terrace property here that's got blue and green walls and windows, which suggests they're pretty well insulated. But if you look at that roof space, we've got a red roof there. So that would suggest that there's little or no insulation in that roof space and all the heat in that property is going straight out of the roof. And it looks like it's maybe got a room in the roof. It looks like there's a Velux window in. So it might be very difficult to insulate that room in the roof. But unfortunately, the unintended consequence of that is a lot of heat escaping through there and that might end up resulting in damp and mould in that, that room in the roof area as well. And thermal bridging 
are also known as cold bridges and these are weak points in the building envelope which allow heat to pass through more easily so these occur where materials which are better conductors of heat are allowed to make contact with other materials with better sorry they occur where materials uh, which are better conductors of heat are allowed to form a bridge between the inner and outer face of a construction and this commonly happens where there's a gap in the insulation layer or where an element such as a, a joist penetrates through the uh, through the construction so we can here see here the, the thermal bridging that's caused by the windows and also by some of the timbers in this property causing a differential heat loss through the property so thermal bridge is quite difficult to deal with in terms of standard retrofit this gets down to you know high level of detailed design in terms of thermal bridging but these are factors that need to be considered in terms of air infiltration thermal bypass and thermal bridging so we've got some of the ideas around what retrofit is why we need to do it and some of the key terms so the next question is well what retrofit options are available then and, you know these are measures that have been around for many years most of these so we've got insulation measures you'll have heard of most of these if not all of these uh, cavity wall external wall insulation loft and roof insulation but we're also starting to carry out things like party wall insulation as well so we've got adjoining properties you know that share a lounge wall for example we're also starting to insulate those party walls because it could be that mr smith in number one has a much higher temperature than you know mr harold in number three and the, the heat loss there's a heat loss between the two properties so making sure that we insulate those party walls is critical to, to the thermal performance of the property we've obviously got heating measures as well not just in terms of the actual the, the, the technology whether it's a boiler or a storage heater but we've got the heating controls uh, we're starting to see infrared panels come out now which actually heat the the person rather than the space and we're starting to see high high retention modern storage heaters as well uh, deployed so obviously not everyone's got gas we're trying to move away from gas as well but it may be that some people aren't quite ready to make that transition to heat pumps currently so measures such as infrared panels and high heat retention storage heaters are an interim measure for the next 15 years or so until people have got confidence and financial capacity to invest in heat pumps and we've got some of the other measures there as well but the one i want to draw your attention to there which often gets forgotten about is ventilation uh, so ventilation is key in all of these approaches when we talk about retrofit especially the fabric first approach it's almost like putting a blanket over the top of the home to make it nice and warm and cozy and that's great but if you're also starting to then increase the air tightness of the property as well it means that there's more moisture in the property and that moisture can't get out you know the more people live in it people generate moisture just through their normal breathing and bathing patterns and cooking and so on and if that moisture can't escape the home then it starts to form uh, in terms of uh, black mold and damp and that causes a problem so ventilation is a real key now in terms of how we deal with that that, that um, moisture buildup and that can be through uh, mechanical ventilation heat recovery or background ventilation or even just natural and purge ventilation but making sure adequate ventilation strategies are built into retrofit is critical and here's some examples of retrofit interventions i'm sure you've seen most of these before and um, the top right uh, sorry the top middle one the air source heat pump is something that you're probably starting to see more and more in your local areas or in your housing stock if you're a, a social housing provider but yeah just just some good examples really in terms of perhaps at the normalness of the retrofit measures in terms of you know they're not particularly challenging the challenge is getting them right and doing it in a sequenced effective manner and some of that challenge is also around the you know, green skills in the supply chain so we've got some great ambitions to meet EPCC to be net zero by 2050 and you as your individual organizations you might have other targets that you're trying to achieve but you know having a target and an ambition is one thing but you ultimately need someone to deliver that on the ground for you and that's why we're trying to do a lot more work with the supply chain through rise as well we recognize that there's a need for green skills and extra capacity within the supply chain you know we're seeing a rise in demand uh, for green skills in terms of the growth sector you know we, we know the scale of the retrofit challenge to get to 2050 which means there's an urgent need for skills there's educational gaps that need to be addressed, you know, back through the education system. But there's also a perception of, of the types of skills that are required um, in terms of, you know, working on the tools versus, you know, working as a designer behind the scenes. There's different perceptions that we're trying to overcome 
all the while by trying to bring an EDI approach in, in terms of making it more diverse and inclusive as well. And obviously the big uh, factor that we've got with green uh, skills and the rise in demand is technological base in terms of the way the sector is changing in some of the measures and how they're deployed. So we, at one of the previous slides, looked at underfloor insulation and some of you may be carrying out this already, but you know, there's solutions such as Qbot insulation, which is a little robot device that drives around under the floor to insulate the, the, the floor void. So already technology is starting to move at pace in terms of how we install measures. And what we know is a recent Chartered Institute building uh, report suggested we need to have an additional 350,000 full-time equivalent workers by 2028. And that needs diverse talent recruitment. It's not just all in one trade, it's across all the different trades and all the different skills. We need designers, we need assessors, we need people that can maintain and service these technologies as well. And this brings you know different challenges that we need to address. So if we're looking at retrofit, we need to understand the impact that retrofit measures are having. So how do we measure energy efficiency? Well, I mentioned earlier on, we've got um, uh, an EPC, an energy performance certificate, and this is where properties can receive an EPC rating from A, which is very efficient, uh, to G, uh, which has been highly inefficient. 60% of UK homes are currently rated at D or below. Houses typically with a C rating or higher are more comfortable for occupants. And research has shown that it can be sold for around 16% more on the open market as well. So there are added benefits to improving, you know, retrofit and energy performance of housing stock as well. But we need to also need to recognise that EPCs aren't perfect. I think there's been quite a bit of uh, media recently, actually, in the last week or so, uh, around about the, the, you know, how inaccurate they can be in terms of calculation and the advice given for improvement measures. But the, the law current recommends that EPCs are required for all properties that are let or sold. So it allows us to at least benchmark and compare properties, even if it isn't perfect. It allows for some analysis of our housing stock. And by law, all current rental properties need to have a minimum E rating by 2028. So there's a, there's a sort of a drive there to increase the energy performance of housing stock as well. EPCs are ultimately uh, driven by SAP, the Standard Assessment Procedure. So this is a methodology to assess and compare the energy and environmental performance of buildings. And SAP is ultimately a big calculation tool that sits behind it. Uh, where it takes in all the factors of the property, you know, number of windows, size of them, what materials are made of, uh, size of the property, heating systems. It puts it all through a massive calculation engine and that gives you the, the SAP score from 0 to 100. And that's what's built into the EPC score as well. Um, so SAP is a really important tool, a bit more accurate than uh, an EPC. An EPC uses called something called reduced data SAP, RD SAP, which is a, a quicker, more efficient way to collect the information when you're out on site. Whereas a full SAP, a standard assessment procedure, requires a lot more fields and a lot more data to be to be gathered, which would be very difficult to do uh, as a part of an EPC survey. So if you are thinking about you know how you can effectively get some good quality data on your housing stock, you may want to think about moving towards that more full SAP approach as well. And there are different approaches as well. There's something called the passive house planning package. And this is generally adopted for passive house and very low energy building projects. And this you know, calculates specific requirements for heating, cooling, primary and primary energy demand as well. So passive house is really about trying to eliminate all energy use in the property and drive it down to an absolute minimum. So there are different ways, and different levels that you can really measure and assess energy performance of housing stock. And just got a couple of graphs here that just demonstrate that. So on the left hand side is the EPC reference that I talked about earlier in terms of the split of EPC ratings in the UK currently. Uh, you can see that we've got some A, B and C. A lot of those A, Bs and Cs will actually be new build properties as well, uh, but there will be some retrofits in there. But you can see how D's, E's, F's and G's make up the majority of the housing stock in the UK. And on the right hand side, we've just got a, a bit of a screenshot there of the passive house uh, planning package verification sheet. Uh, just for a bit of information as well. So that talks about air infiltration and a few other details that you wouldn't normally capture as part of an EPC. So let's have a look at roles and responsibilities. But before we do that, let's have a think about you know when retrofit goes wrong. 
because ultimately the reason we've got some of the new roles and responsibilities in the system now is because of previous schemes that haven't delivered on their intended outcomes. So we've got a couple of examples here. A example one is from, so I'm just trying to see these pictures here, poorly Poorly installed external wall insulation, allowing moisture to saturate the insulation and eventually causing damage to inter interior surfaces, black mould and fungal growth. And that was to uh, around about 300 homes where that made a lot of those homes un uninhabitable and obviously significant health and well-being issues as well. So when you think about the intentions of retrofit to make the homes warmer, healthier, where retrofit goes wrong, it can have the complete opposite impact and effect. So we need to be very careful in terms of why we try and retrofit properties. And we've also got the middle example around about uh, water ingress into a cavity, which wasn't spotted during the initial survey and installation, uh, which has caused damp and mould in thousands of properties again. And then the third, uh, third example is water ingress in between existing walls and the external wall insulation due to poor installation. These are just three examples, but you can see here, you know, the, the third example is another 104 homes that were rendered damp and uninhabitable as well. So we started to see impacts on a larger scale uh, and it got to the point where we needed to ensure that we could make sure that retrofit could be delivered to better quality. So the question is, how do we do that? Well, it's around about tenant protection to make sure that retrofits meet tenants' needs with a mechanism in place to report issues. It's about, about making sure we can provide advice and guidance to access impartial advice, uh, providing comprehensive information about existing and future measures. So on that long-term journey to retrofit that I spoke about earlier. It's about skills and training as well, because obviously a lot of these installation issues might just come through to poor skills and poor training and you know, some knowledge gaps as well. So this is about filling knowledge gaps to ensure that people from all stages of the retrofit process are upskilled and appropriately trained. And robust standards is really key, and that's one of the things that's changed. So we've got past 2035 and Trustmark. These are a couple of things I'm going to come on to shortly and tell you about, but these are, are really what driving better standards, especially in social housing retrofit uh, projects where PAS might be more adequately uh, and effectively applied. And ultimately, we've got compliance and enforcement. So it's about ensuring that standards are met, and if not met, uh, to make sure there's an effective redress for the consumer. All of these examples that we showed here ultimately had an impact on the tenant or the resident living in those homes that they had to move out. They maybe never, never came back to these homes. The homes may have been uninhabitable to come back to. And obviously we need to make sure that we're not impacting people's lives in such a way by trying to force retrofit and do it in a bad way. And that's why PAS 2035 exists. So PAS 2035 is a British standard for retrofitting dwellings. It was first published in 2019 and it had a revision last year as well. And the standard outlines how retrofit projects should be managed and delivered. We've also got past 2030 as well. And that's actually the British standard for the installation, commissioning and handover of energy uh, efficiency measures. So past 2030 is what the, <coughs> sorry, the supply chain and installers are working to in terms of the standards. And past 2035 is a process that needs to be followed to ensure that the, you know, the, 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 ultimately the end user is protected. There's some key points in this. Well, PAS, which stands for publicly, publicly available specification, it was sponsored by the government and designed by the British Standards Institute, the BSI. It provides a, a framework for deep retrofit projects that are high quality, safe and fit for the future. It all helps to address the fundamental structural issues that blight many, many, many energy efficiency projects, such as defects, unintended consequences, uh, shallow retrofit, where maybe we're not going deep enough, you know, we're just doing light touch measures that aren't really making any impact. Poor design in terms of poor or no design sometimes. Something called the performance gap where, you know, we maybe set out to achieve, you know, we might measure it in terms of temperature, you know, we're going to reduce, sorry, in terms of bills, we're going to reduce the energy bills in that home by a hundred pounds a year, but actually we only reduce it by 10 pounds which means it's got a 90% performance gap, it's only achieved a tenth, you know, a tenth of what it's out to achieve. And the key principles are really around that fabric first approach to make sure we get the fabric right, but then linking it back to what we said at the very start, it's that whole house retrofit to think about a sequenced stepped approach 
for what happens at you've done the first measure, how you then go on to measure two, three, and four in the future. And there's different roles and responsibilities required in PAS. And these are all roles that you might want to consider. You know, if you're a housing provider, these are you need to think about how you'll procure these, or do you bring them in-house, or do you get them for your contractors? And if you're a contractor on, on today's masterclass, you know, it's about understanding whether you can provide these services or whether you need to bring new skills into your organization as well. And ultimately, it's about forming the right team. You know, it can be done in-house. Uh, underskilled staff will need to be uh, provided with relevant training, but it can be carefully outsourced as well. We've got key members of the team that are required by PAS 2035. Ultimately, the key the keen team member is a person on the right-hand side, the retrofit coordinator. They are pretty much the linchpin of the whole process. They manage and oversee all the different roles, and they manage and oversee the overall installation. But we've also got a retrofit assessor who goes out and assesses a property in a bit more depth than a normal EPCC. We've got a retrofit designer, uh, which may, may often be an external design consultant uh, or an architect. We've got a retrofit installer, obviously the person responsible for installing the measures, but installing them to the correct accreditations. And then we've also got the uh, retrofit evaluator as well, which is someone who goes out at the end and says, we had an intention of saving a hundred pounds on the bills. The, the, the hundred pounds isn't a good reference. We wouldn't normally measure it in pounds, but I mentioned it earlier. Has that been met? You know, have we managed to achieve a hundred pounds saving? And if not, why not? And can we put that right? So that evaluator role is really critical now to try and make sure that we can start addressing any consequences that come from the retrofit that maybe haven't met the intentions that we set out. And I mentioned that the main focus is on the retrofit coordinator as they ultimately provide oversight for the entire retrofit process. And this can be outsourced. You know, this is a skill that you need to have in your own organization. There's a you know, there's a wealth of retrofit coordinators out there who have the specific skills and accreditations to drop onto your projects and support you. And when it comes to certification and accreditation, there's two key elements to it, to the PASS process and ultimately to certifying and accrediting your retrofit schemes. So Trustmark is a government endorsed quality scheme in the UK, which doesn't just cover retrofit, it covers a variety of different uh, measures as well, but it's also addressing retrofit. And it provides a guarantee ultimately. So if something does go wrong, like those photographs we showed you earlier, and that residence is inconvenienced and the home becomes damaged as a result of poor installation, there's a guarantee there. And it allows that, that issue to be addressed and rectified. And it allows it to be done in such a way that for example, if the installer went bust, which has done previously, that resident or that housing provider can still access uh, a resolution with or without that, that contractor in business still. So it's a really peace of mind guarantee that we need in retrofit with so many changes going on in the external market. We've also got uh, the Micro Generation Certification Scheme, MCS. This has been around a lot longer now. This ultimately came in uh, back in the time of uh, the solar sort of PV feeding tariff and this is a contractor certification scheme for low carbon and renewable technologies so this covers things like heat pumps, solar thermal panels, maybe something we don't hear about so much in you know, these days, you know, solar panels to heat our water, more commonly we hear about solar PV now for generation of electricity and it also covers things like battery storage as well, you know, new emerging technologies. And this is about ensuring that equipment is safe and installed to good standards by competent operatives. So, you know, the journey that we've taken over the last few years has really started to show uh, and provide a lot more assurance and guarantees for all people involved in retrofit. And the final thing I wanted to wrap up on really is when we talk about retrofit, you know, sometimes we chase it for the wrong reasons. We may just be going to, you know, win an award. You know, we want to, you know, there's a, a local award opened up here to, you know, as a flagship scheme. Let's see if we can do a pilot project or something. Or there might be some funding that's become available from a variety of sources. And people might jump on those. And it's a good opportunity to start your retrofit. But ultimately, you need to think about a strategic approach to retrofit. And this is, you know, through different approaches. So it's about preparation in terms of of getting senior level buying from the top in terms of you know what's the long-term ambition is it net zero 2050 is it net zero 2040 or is it something entirely different it's about creating a team and it might be that you need to create a bigger team beyond your own organization you might not be big enough uh, as your organization and you may want to join a consortium to you know to bring that extra skill and that extra capacity into your team 
a lot of the strategy needs data collection and analysis. So, you know, the stuff we talked about, EPCs and SAP, that's all built on data. The better data you have, the more confident data you have, the better the retrofit outcomes will be. And that allows you to start to develop the retrofit interventions and think about those in terms of that fabric first, whole house sequenced approach as well. We mentioned resident engagement earlier. You know, you can do all of those top four bullet points absolutely perfectly. But until you go and knock on someone's door and try and encourage them to have the measure, that's when the whole project can fall down when they say, actually, no, thanks. I've got no interest in having a heat pump. So planning resident engagement is critical to the success of any project. Without that front door opening, you're not going to decarbonize, reduce the fuel bills of that without the resident agreeing. Obviously, business cases are critical to selling it. You know, how are you going to sell the business case to that senior level buying? Is it around financial savings? Is it around about carbon savings? Is it more around the social impact? Or is it around about the skills and trading that you can provide to the local supply chain in terms of upskilling, uh, you know, local SMEs in your area? You know, there's different preparation mechanisms that you can see there as well. But the last one, the monitoring and evaluation strategy is critical as well. So often we prepare approaches uh, but we don't really consider how we're going to measure the effectiveness of them as well so it's really important to make sure we develop that at the start of the project and then bring it in at the end as you can see on the right hand side so we move through delivery which is you know, around making sure we've got uh, assessments and benchmarking so we can understand what's going well what isn't going well detailed designs making sure we've got effective delivery plans that consider variety of factors so you know consider the seasons in the UK I know at the moment it feels like we're missing a season I think I've got a stinking cold at the moment because I think we're missing summer um, but you need to think about you know if we're going to install external wall insulation and new windows do we really want to do that in November and December it's probably not the best time of year to do that so it's around about thinking when can we deliver measures to certain areas and obviously that leads to the installation side as well and then post retrofit is critical this is where you hand it back to the resident but you need to make sure that resident actually knows what they've got you know see so if you've installed a new heat pump they don't know how to use it and they don't know how to ask for help if they can't use it so are you going to record a youtube video or are you going to do like a little qr code on the on the unit so they can scan the qr code which will take them to a, a help help portal where they can find out more information you need to think about maintaining these systems so we spoke about that in the skills earlier you might be you know moving away from gas boilers so you've got loads of gas operatives in your organization can you upskill the gas operatives to start maintaining electric heating systems as well and i mentioned it just a couple of minutes ago that ongoing monitoring and evaluation is really critical not just critical to understand whether the true impacts of the project were successful in terms of what you set out to achieve in terms of you know benefiting the organization and the resident but ultimately in helping inform that future business case to say actually we've done this to 100 homes already and it worked really well you know we made a million you know a, a million tons of carbon savings saved an average of 83 pounds per and all the residents gave us a 10 out of 10 in terms of how comfy they're feeling the homes so embedding that monitoring the evaluation strategy early in the preparation and carrying it out post retrofit not only helps measure the success of your immediate scheme, but can ultimately lead to future success as well. So that's pretty much the end of our little beginner's guide today. Uh, but we've got a few more links here for you. We've got the Retrofit Academy that provides a really good wealth of information around past 2035 and past 2030. If you are interested in qualifying, you know, through the various roles and responsibilities, there's details on there around, you know, what you need to do, potential training courses as well. Alex has dropped the link to the BSI group in there as well, where you can find out more about the specific details of the PAS requirements. And then I wouldn't say more importantly, but from our side of things, we've also got the RISE link as well. Obviously, we're here from RISE today uh, and we've got the, the link to RISE there where we, we've got a wealth of information and an ongo a, a growing ongoing knowledge hub there. So we're going to load more and more information on there. And obviously, you know, we want to hear from you what particular information you might want to see on there as well. RISE is a long journey ahead over the next three years. So it's a chance to support you, whatever the type of organisation you might be in your retrofit journey.